Welcome to tonight's Expert Angle webinar titled Mindfulness and Cancer. What is it and how can it help me? My name is Julia Stevenson and I'm the Health Promotion Specialist at Prostate Cancer Canada. I will be moderating tonight's webinar. Please note that we are recording this webinar and it will be available for listening to on the Prostate Cancer Canada website in a couple of days. We'll start with a few housekeeping items. First, the Expert Angle team will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. Please keep questions related to tonight's webinar topic. Second, questions will be answered during the question and answer period at the end of the webinar. Third, all attendees are automatically placed on mute to allow for the best quality audio. If you are looking for further information on prostate cancer, please connect with our helpline at 1-855-PCC-INFO or you can email them at support at prostatecancer.ca. And now I would like to introduce you to today's guest speaker, Dr. Linda Carlson. Dr. Linda Carlson holds the Enbridge Research Chair in Psychosocial Oncology and is full professor in Psychosocial Oncology in the Department of Oncology, Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. She is the Director of Research and works as a clinical psychologist at the Department of Psychosocial Resources at the Tom Baker Cancer Center. Dr. Carlson's research in psychosocial oncology has been published in many high-impact journals and book chapters, and she has received many national and international awards for her work. She published a patient manual in 2010 with Michael Specka entitled Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery, a step-by-step -step MBSR approach to help you cope with treatment and reclaim your life, in addition to a professional training manual in 2009 with Shauna Shapiro entitled The Art and Science of Mindfulness, Integrating Mindfulness into Psychology and the Helping Professions. She has published over 150 research papers and book chapters, holds several millions of dollars in grant funding, and is regularly invited to present her work at international conferences. It is with great pleasure that I turn this webinar over to Dr. Carlson. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So let me make sure everybody's in the right place. You see the cartoon. She says, we're here for the happiness through meditation seminar. Oh, no, that was a typo. It's actually happiness through medication. She says to her friend, I told you we should have gone to the movies instead of pursuing happiness. So this is the meditation talk, not the medication talk. And I'm going to go through a number of different topics. And first of all, the idea of what is mindfulness. So I'll define that term for you and give you some examples. And then I'll talk a bit about different mindfulness-based interventions, as we call them. And specifically get into our program called Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery and some other mindfulness research in different areas looking at cognitive function and brain functioning. So first of all, what is mindfulness anyway? So Time Magazine, you can see from these covers, would have us believe that it's this blissful state where you have no thoughts and you're kind of zoned out and you turn into a beautiful young woman. Well, that's a bit of a myth of mindfulness. Um, the fact of it is that it's not always a blissful state where your mind goes completely blank. Um, the way we actually define it is paying attention on purpose in the present moment with an attitude that's open and accepting. So mindfulness is a way of being in the world. It doesn't take extra time to pay attention in the present moment as you're going through your life. But it's also a practice that we do, a training, a mindfulness meditation. So in the first cartoon here, we can see it as a way of being in the world. Is your mind full or are you mindful? So you can see here that the dog is winning the mindfulness contest. And it's also a practice. We set aside time in our daily life to sit down and practice the skill. And it's a skill that we learn of mindfulness. So this is someone practicing meditation. You don't have to sit on a rock overlooking the ocean to do this. Maybe that would be nice. But you can practice mindfulness in your everyday life in many different ways. So it's a way of being in the world. It's a practice. And it has a number of different components. So it's pretty simple, but it's not easy. Because what is your mind doing instead? turns out we have anywhere from 50,000 to 70,000 individual thoughts every single day. That's a lot. And of those thoughts, almost half of them are not in the present moment. That is, they're mind wandering. And when you're mind wandering, it turns out you're less happy. So when they actually ping people throughout the day, at the times when they're in the present moment, they're happier than when their mind is wandering. Why might that be? Well, where do minds wander? So they might be like this guy here. And he's worrying about the future. He's thinking, oh my gosh, all the things I have to do, how am I going to manage it all? What if this terrible thing happens? What if that happens? And he's getting stressed out. He's getting anxious. This woman here might be ruminating in the past. So she's thinking, oh, why did I say that or do that or I forgot this? And why me? Or if only I'd done this or that, things would be different. And she's having regrets and she's feeling angry perhaps and quite depressed. 
So when our thoughts are like that in the past or they're racing to the future, we miss the present moment, which is the only time we actually do our living. So the idea of mindfulness about being in the present moment has three main components. So the first at the top here is the why of it. So why be mindfulness? That's our intention. And intentions can vary and change as you practice mindfulness over the years. So your intention is like a direction, a guidance, a compass point. It's not a specific goal necessarily. It just sort of points your way. So intention can be as simple as just wanting to be more awake and aware as we live our lives. It can be more esoteric, like I would like to have self-transcendence. It can be more community-minded. Um, I want to be more compassionate to other people. It can also be fairly simple, like I just want to sleep better. So that's the why of practicing. What's your intention? The next component here is the what, what we actually do when we train ourselves in mindfulness. This is training attention, so the attentional component. So what we're actually doing when we sit down every day is learning to focus our attention in the present moment. And when it drifts away, which it will inevitably, we lead it back. And we do that time and time again, a hundred, a thousand times. And that rewires our brain to be able to pay attention in the present moment rather than this habitual track of going over the past or worrying about the future. So that's the second component of mindfulness, attention. The third component, it's really important too, is how we do it. How do we pay attention? And that's all about our attitudes. So the attitudes that are helpful for learning mindfulness and really as we move through our lives are attitudes of acceptance, openness, kindness, curiosity, non-judging. I'll talk more about those in a moment. So we like to use a lot of poetry in our program. This one poem, I think, illustrates mindfulness nicely. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. And that's Henry David Thoreau saying that. And so we realize is that if we don't pay attention, our whole lives can pass us by, and we'll say, that was it? Was I there for it? So we really need to wake up and be there for our lives, show up. So why practice mindfulness? Well, it turns out that the only certainty in life is change, and this is just a fact of life that however things are in this moment, they're going to be different in the next moment and the next and the next. But another immutable fact is that we're often unwilling to acknowledge this or act upon this reality. And that's one of the root causes of all suffering is our inability to allow or accept change. So we want things to be a certain way. We want things to stay a certain way. And that's really an impossible sort of wish. So mindfulness is one process by which we face and accept this inevitability of constant change. I mean, it's good news and bad, right? So if things are great, well, they're not going to be great forever. But if things are bad, well, they're not going to be bad forever either. They're constantly in flux. So we, we need to, to, in order to be happy and move through lives, our lives successfully, we need to accept this reality that things are always changing. So I mentioned the mindfulness attitudes as the third component, and I'll go over in a bit more detail about some of those specific attitudes. So I mentioned non-judging. So this is the idea of, first of all, being aware of the fact that we are constantly judging our experience. So you may not be aware of that, but if you pay attention to your thoughts, you're always saying, oh, I like this, I don't like that, I wish this was different, you know, this is good, this is bad. Uh, you know, I don't like the way she's speaking, or I was thinking this webinar would be slightly different, right? So we're always judging, and the first step in non-judging is first noticing it, and noticing the judging about ourselves, right? Oh, I'm no good at this, I can't meditate, I'm doing it all wrong. So when those thoughts come up, you just become aware of them, kind of laugh at yourself and let it go. You don't judge the non-judging. The next attitude that's really important for learning mindfulness is patience, because it's not a quick fix. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, we're very impatient in our society. It's like, I want to learn how to relax, and I want to do it now, now. And you can see that that's counterproductive. So your body and nature has its own schedule for healing, for learning, for adapting, and we have to be persistent with a practice like this and patient and allow it to work, because it will have an effect, but only 
if we practice on a regular basis, basis and we allow that to happen. Acceptance, I've mentioned already. Um, this can be a tough one when you're dealing with cancer because nobody wants to have cancer. And acceptance is not the same as giving up or giving in. It's not stopping to try to find different treatments and cures. It's more about looking at things as they are and being willing to accept that. So yeah, no, I didn't ask to have cancer, but here I am in this situation. It sucks. I'm sad. I'm angry. But that's OK. You know, This is where I'm at. And you have to work through where you're at and be willing to face it and accept it before you can ever move on to something else. Letting go is a similar kind of concept to what we're talking about with constant change. So this recognition that we can't force things to be the way we want them all the time and we can't force them to stay the same or we can't force them to change more quickly. We have to let go of this controlling nature that many of us have and allow the ebb and flow of things at their own pace. Sound driving is a similar kind of idea and it's paradoxical. Um, you know, if we have objectives that are too tightly held, um, the paradox of it is that they're less likely to, to occur. So if you have specific objectives that are in mind, specific goals as you start a mindfulness program, you have to kind of let them go and really focus on just learning how to be in the moment. Um, and then you might get to the place you want to be or you might end up somewhere entirely different. The attitude of trust is really speaks to beginning to tune into your own wisdom and your own intuition. And when it comes to you know, matters of personal growth, you're the expert on you. We tend to turn ourselves over to the authorities, the experts, you know, when we're going through cancer care, medical experts or experts in this, that, and the other thing. Um, but at the bottom of it all, each person is their own expert. So trusting in your own intuition. And also trusting in the types of mindfulness practices that we train people in because they've been around for two, three thousand years and not for no reason. And then this other attitude we call beginner's mind. So this is an idea about seeing yourself and your abilities for the first time and seeing the people around you as if for the first time, as if you're a child, you know, freed from these old stereotypes and labels. So you might say, oh, I'm not someone who meditates. I wouldn't do that or I wouldn't do yoga. That's, I'm not that kind of person. Well, maybe you are. You know, maybe you made these judgments about yourself a long time ago and things are different now. So starting over again in every moment is also a chance to be a beginner. That's the opposite of being a cynic almost, kind of seen it all, done it all, boring, right? So this is where things become interesting and they become beautiful and exciting again. So people in our programs will often say, well, come on, it's only a two-week, two-month course. How can I possibly change my entire way of being? And we say, well, that's fine. You know, these attitudes aren't something you're going to adopt overnight. But if you think about not moving in those directions, like what are the opposite, right? So you could be a judgmental, impatient, rejecting, grasping, striving, suspicious, know-it-all. So that's your choice. You can move towards the mindfulness attitudes or you can continue down this other path. And usually I do this to live audience. So, you know, I'll ask people, how many of you describe yourself this way. And there's usually a few people saying, oh, that's exactly how I am, and it's terrible. So here's another poem that illustrates some of the attitudes. It's called The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness, a momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still treat each guest honorably. They may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. And that's Rumi. So you can see in this poem, it's not talking about everything being blissful and wonderful all the time. It's just saying, open yourself up to the full range of the human experience and meet them at the door laughing. So have a light attitude about it. Be joyful. And that's the approach you want to take when you're learning mindfulness meditation. So all of this wisdom of the mindfulness practices has been distilled into several different interventions. And the most famous and well-known is called mindfulness-based stress reduction. And this was developed in the late 1970s, actually, by a fellow named John Kabat-Zinn. This is his book here at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. 
Um, and what he did actually was combine stress reduction techniques that were kind of becoming popular at the time with mindfulness meditation techniques that originally came from Buddhist teachings and practices in Asia. So we put them together in this eight-week program. It's secular. It was offered at the medical center. And he offered it to people who were kind of falling through the cracks in the medical system. They had uh, different illnesses and problems that were difficult to treat. So a lot of them had chronic pain or they had anxiety or they were dealing with diseases like uh, cardiovascular disease or cancer, a wide range of different things. And so we started offering this eight-week program and evaluating it and found that it was really, really helpful for people dealing with a wide range of problems. And he wrote this book, Full Catastrophe Living, which I highly recommend. It's in its second or third edition by now. And it really takes you in uh, in-depth look about the development of that program and the components and how you can apply mindfulness. So since he, he first originated that program and did the original research, there's hundreds and hundreds of studies that have now been conducted on this program and applying it to people with all sorts of different problems. And really, this MBSR program has been shown effective now for a huge range of physical and psychological disorders and different symptoms. And I'll show you a list of that a bit later on. So when we look at the mindfulness, just to give you an idea of how popular it's become lately, you can see in this graph, here it is, that really before the year 2000, this is the number of publications each year. There was a few. You know, John Kabat-Zinn had his first publication in 1982, and these were all kind of from his group. And then we had our first publication in the year 2000. We started our program for cancer patients in 1998. So we were really on the early um, sort of leading edge of this curve, and just since then, in the last few years, it's just skyrocketed. You can see there's over 600, almost 700 scholarly, these are publications in the academic sort of scientific literature. Um, so it's nearly impossible now to even keep up with what's going on in the research area. But mindfulness has really gone mainstream, you might say. So our program is called Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery, and it's an adaptation of the original MBSR. And here's a group of people um, who are part of our group. So why would mindfulness be helpful in the cancer experience? So you can see the cartoon. Here's the spider. Oh, my life's a mess. I seem to be spinning out of control. And that's how a lot of cancer patients feel, too. So some of the elements of the cancer experience that are, that are amenable to sort of responding to mindfulness treatments, the first one is the inevitable life threat. So no matter what your prognosis, you know, how early stages of cancer is, it always brings up this issue of mortality. Um, everyone knows we're going to die, but it's kind of more a theoretical thing, you know, somewhere in the future. Getting that cancer diagnosis really brings it closer to home, and people um, have to look more closely at the fact that their life might be shorter than they thought, or they might, it might end in a different way. So these issues around impermanence and death have to be confronted. Um, and really, the mindfulness program is a really good way to train yourself on how to look at that in a way that's less threatening for many people. I mentioned loss of control. You know, once you get that cancer diagnosis, again, you're turning yourself over to the medical system. They're telling you what to do, when to do it. Um, and that can be very difficult for people, especially also the uncertainty that goes with that. So these ideas of letting go and non-attachment that we focus on in the mindfulness training can be very helpful in dealing with this inevitable loss of control. And I mentioned the loss of certainty, too. So certainty about the day-to-day -day stuff, you're just, your routine is completely thrown off. You may have to take time off work. Your retirement may be put into question. Um, you know, you thought your life was going to go a certain way, and now you're not so sure what's going to happen. So there's a real loss of certainty and not knowing how your future is going to look. And those are things that many people have a hard time coping with. And this type of program can help there, too. Many feelings arise. Grief, fear, anger, depression are all very common reactions to coping with cancer. Um, and we need to find a safe place to experience our emotions and process them. So peer support is great for that. Seeing a counselor is great for that. A mindfulness practice can also be a very safe um, container for people to allow themselves to explore their feelings of grief and fear and anger. There's also a lot of symptoms people often experience related to the disease or the treatment, such as pain. Fatigue is a very common uh, side effect of a lot of cancer treatments. And many, many people struggle with insomnia and sleep problems. Um, it turns out this program is helpful for those symptoms as well. And there's an, 
this inevitable fear of recurrence. So, you know, no matter how good your prognosis, again, once you've been through cancer treatment, most people are always kind of worried that it's going to come back. And so every A can pain, you know, can bring up a lot of anxiety around, oh my, God, oh my goodness, is that the cancer returning? So the mindfulness program also gives you tools to help you cope with that fear of recurrence. So our program was developed in 1996 initially by my colleagues, Michael Specka, Maureen Angan, and Eileen Goody. Um, I arrived there in 1997 to just, as a re resident in, psych in psychology, is just finishing my PhD. And these folks are based in, basing it on their personal yoga and meditation practices. So they sort of thought, if this helps us in difficult times, maybe it'll be helpful for the people we work with. So I came in 1997 and had some familiarity with the mindfulness model from the University of Massachusetts and John Kabat-Zinn's work. And so we refined our program from what they had started and the MBSR curriculum in around 1998, and that's when we started doing research. So we have an ongoing clinical program that's open to any cancer patients um, in the area, um, and any of their family members or support people can come along too. We've had over 2,000 participants, probably more. By now, we do it in groups of 15 to 20 people at a time. We offer anywhere from 6 to 10 groups a year. So we have this ongoing clinical program, and then we embed research studies in the clinical program. We'll invite people to participate when we want to look at specific outcomes or specific groups of patients and that sort of thing. So as I said, we began our research program in 1998. Um, and since then, we've investigated a real wide range of outcomes and symptoms looking at psychological distress, um, positive outcomes, I'm going to go into this a bit in a moment, different symptoms, and then taking blood and saliva samples and actually looking at um, biomarkers, we call them, so markers of physical health and seeing if those change as well. So as we adapted and modified the program, we came up with the name Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery, um, we call it now, or MBCR. Um, so it was mentioned at the beginning that we'd written a book, so this is it. It's called Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery, not a very creative title. <laughs> Michael Speck and I wrote it. Um, it came out in 2011, and this is for you if you're patient and, and support people. It's a really easy to read, fairly, you know, short book. It's a, a paperback, and it covers the whole curriculum of the program week by week, and it's got exercises and scripts. So it's meant to be a home study program for people who don't have access to it in person. And that's, uh, it's fairly inexpensive. You can get it at any bookstore. So it's a nine-week intervention now. It was eight weeks, but we've added a week um, for orientation. And the sessions are one and a half to two hours. There's one or two instructor instructors in the course. And each week it has the same format. So we start with a discussion. We check in with people's home practice. We have some uh, content that we want to teach around, you know, stress responding or cognitive coping, and each week it's different. Then there's always some mindful yoga. So this is very gentle, half the yoga. It's, you know, no one's wrapping their leg around their neck or anything like that. Um, it starts out very gentle. It's really about mindful movement. And then we have different types of meditations, and I'll tell you a bit about those in a moment. So we do that each week. Um, we learn different yoga postures, different meditations. There's a booklet we have that outlines the program, and we give people uh, CDs or uh, MP3 tracks of guided meditations that they use for their home practice. They're meant to do um, daily practice of about 45 minutes. They keep track of their practice in a homework log, and we have a six-hour silent retreat uh, near the end of the program on a Saturday where we combine all the practices together. So the components of the program include mindfulness is the overarching theme. So really everything we're doing are just different ways to train ourselves in how to be more present in the current moment. We teach people about relaxation and how to know when their body and their muscles are relaxed versus tense, and we train them in some breathing exercises that help with relaxation. As I mentioned, the gentle yoga is a central component. I think this is important for people recovering from cancer because for many people, you know, they have had surgery or chemo, they've stopped their typical exercise routine, they might have a lower level of fitness or functional ability than before. So it's a really good way to get started again, to reconnect with your body as it is now, um, and to befriend yourself again in a way. So we talk about the mind-body connection and how thoughts, or all our sort of psychological experience is reflected in the body. So there's no real difference between the mind and the body. Every state of mind has their state of body. Every state of body affects the way you feel and think. 
We train people in some visualization and imagery exercises that help with their meditation practice. And we take a page from what's called cognitive behavior therapy and talk about how we think influences the way we feel and how mindfulness can help us understand or become aware of our automatic thoughts that might not be helpful. There's a big element of personal empowerment. Uh, this is something people can do for themselves when they're going through this difficult time. Um, you know, as I said, oh, there's a lot of loss and control and uncertainty. So this is a tool that people have that they can use. And there's an element of social support because it's done in a group setting. Um, and people really come to enjoy having a, a group of people going through a similar experience to learn together. So we have a different theme each week. The first week is really just an orientation, ground rules, introductions. The second week, we really talk about an introduction to mindfulness, what it is, mindful breathing. The third week, we focus on the attitudes that I briefly outlined for you. The fourth week, we call Mind, Body, Wisdom, and Healing. And here we talk about the stress response and talk about automatic reacting to stress versus more mindful responding to stress. The fifth week, we talk about how to balance out the nervous system using your breathing so you can um, purposefully modulate your level of energy. So if you're too tired, you can bring your energy up. If you're too stressed out and tense, you can bring your energy down. The sixth week is where we talk about the mindful coping and how thoughts influence feelings and how mindfulness can be a good way to tap into our automatic thoughts. Week seven is where we talk about cultivating beneficial states of heart and mind. So we use imagery there, like this mountain. By the way, I am actually talking to you from the other side of that mountain. So this picture here is Vermilion Lakes and Banff. I live in Canmore, and it's at the base of Runmill Mountain on the other side of the valley. That's where I am right now. <laughs> so we use images like the mountain and the lake um, to help develop qualities that the meditation is helping to um, kind of enhance. Like, for example, with the mountain, you want to feel the solidity of the mountain and its unmovingness and, you know, how it's not bothered by changes in the surface, the weather, the day and the night and the seasons, that kind of stuff. So it helps people that feel that sense of groundedness. Week eight, we talk about deepening and expanding our practice. So moving beyond the initial practices that are training meditation to a more insight type of meditation practice. And the last week is about planning going forward, moving into the world, how are people going to maintain their practice. We know that the best way to learn meditation is with a group and that when people step away from the group, sometimes the practice falls off. So it's always good to have a plan about how are you going to keep it going. So those are the different themes. You can see here some of the different types of practices we do. Um, one is a body scan and that's all these people here. They're very busily doing a body scan. So really you're just lying on the floor and we're bringing your awareness from the tips of your toes right through the top of your head very slowly, one body part at a time. And that's a mindfulness practice because it's an attentional focus practice about being in the moment and beginning to reconnect with what your body's telling you, knowing when you're tense, knowing when you're relaxed, knowing where there's discomfort. Sitting meditation is the heart of many mindfulness practices. This fellow here is sitting on a chair. So you don't have to sit like a pretzel on the floor to do meditation practice. You can sit on a chair or even you know, lie down. And it's really just about, in that practice, about honing focused awareness and concentration, usually on the breath as it flows in and out, and training yourself as your mind wanders to bring it back each time. So it'll wander and you bring it back. Walking meditation, you can see these people here. They're not going anywhere. They're just focusing on the experience of walking, what it feels like to lift a foot, move it forward, place it down, shift the weight. So mindfulness of walking. Open awareness practice is where we begin to broaden our focus from just, say, the breath or the movement in the walking meditation to all of experience. So sensations, spots, emotions sounds, everything that's happening in the, in the moment. This open awareness allows us to develop more insight into impermanence, how things are constantly changing. You can directly experience the nature of the way things are. And I mentioned the mountain and lake practice that we do as well. And finally, the loving kindness practice, kind of illustrated here, is about trying to cultivate feelings of kindness and compassion on purpose for yourself, for your loved ones, for 
friends and acquaintances, and eventually for everyone, for all beings. So that's a quick overview of the different types of practice. So what I thought I would do for the rest of the session is to talk to you about some of the research results that we've had in our program. So just to summarize here, we've done lots of different studies since 1998 when we started. There's a whole bunch of papers. You can find them on my website here. Um, but to summarize, we've seen improvements in different symptoms people have, so improved stress, mood, anger, anxiety, depression. I'll show you some of that in a moment. I mentioned sleep. People do sleep better after the program. They feel less fatigued. They have more energy. And I mentioned the problems with ruminating over the past and worrying about the future. People do that less after the training. There's improved psychological well-being. So people report better quality of life. I'm going to talk to you about spirituality and post-traumatic growth. It might be of interest to some people. And they report being overall more mindful, so they're more in the moment. I mentioned the biological functions. So we've done things like look at people's blood pressure. And people who come into the program with slightly elevated blood pressure, if we measure it week by week through the eight weeks, it decreases over time so that they come back into the range of normal blood pressure. It's almost as effective as taking a medication. And many people actually who go through the program are able to lower their dose or discontinue their high blood pressure meds. We looked at cortisol, which is a stress hormone secreted throughout the day. We've shown changes in the patterns of secretion towards healthier levels. We've looked at cytokines that are markers of inflammation in the immune system. Those patterns change as well towards healthier profiles. And we've looked at something called telomere length, which is a measure within the DNA of the chromosomes. It's associated with cell aging. And it seems possible that this kind of program slows down the cell aging somewhat. This is very preliminary research. So I thought I'd show you the very first study we did. This was a randomized controlled trial. It just means that we flip the coin and assign people with all different types of cancers on or off treatment to either do the MBCR program or to just wait. And the people who were waiting were assessed over the same period of time as the people who did the program. So we focused here on symptoms of stress and mood disturbance. And you can see this is the stage of cancer. And there was all different types, too. So there was a, a mix, early stage, stage one and two, but also later stage, stages three and four as well. And if you look at this graph here, so what we've got here is the profile of mood states. Um, it's mood disturbance, so higher scores are more mood disturbance, they're worse. And this is the pre-measures in the mindfulness group is blue, the control group is red. So before the intervention, they had pretty high levels of mood disturbance, both groups. After the blue group did mindfulness, theirs went down a lot. But the other ones who were waiting, there was very little change. And this just shows you the magnitude of the change. So there was actually a really big decrease in mood disturbance in the people who did the program. And these are the subscales that make up that total score. So showing the change scores, again, the green here is the mindfulness group. So less anxiety, less depression. Whoop. Uh-oh. <laughs> there we go. Less anger, more vigor or energy, a bit less fatigue, and they felt less confused. So the next one is the same idea with symptoms of stress. So beforehand, there was no difference between groups. They had quite a lot of stress symptoms. And these went down more in the mindfulness group than the controls. And if we look at the subscales on that measure, there's this main, uh, the largest change was in a subscale called habitual patterns of stress. And these are things like uh, bad habits, like drinking, overeating, grinding your teeth, uh, not sleeping well, those sorts of things and also a bigger decrease in muscle tension, cardiopulmonary symptoms of stress, like your heart racing and kind of sweaty palms or shortness of breath. People were less irritable and had less anxiety. We looked at sleep outcomes in a sample of 63 people going through the program. So a variety of different types of cancers, again, on and off treatment. And we saw an improvement in a variety of sleep measures, stress, mood, and fatigue. And this is a graph showing you, in this case, just pre and post of just one group. So beforehand, again, higher levels are worse sleep. So we saw improvements here in subjective sleep quality. So they said, oh, I feel like I'm sleeping better. The next biggest one was on sleep duration. So they were sleeping longer. And this one here is sleep efficiency. So they, more of the time they were in bed, they were actually sleeping rather than lying there or tossing and turning. So we saw improvements on a lot of different elements of sleep. Now I want to talk to you about this idea of positive outcomes post-traumatic growth, we call it. So this is the idea that often traumatic events have a silver lining or a bright side. So this is also called benefit finding. 
And people have noticed that trauma can lead to a reevaluation of your place in the world, kind of like, oh, this thing has happened to me. Like, what does it mean? How do I want to live my life? There's the question of why me? It gives people pause to think about what's important to them. And, you know, if my life maybe isn't going to be as long as I thought it was going to be or roll out the way I thought, you know, how do I really want to live my life? And often it can lead to renewed focus on things that bring authentic happiness. So we have a scale called the Post-Traumatic Growth Inventory. And it has these subscales called relating to others, personal strength, seeing new possibilities, having spiritual change, and a greater appreciation of life. The other thing we like to look at is spirituality. And this is distinct from religiosity. So it's not about do you go to church or follow a formal religion. It's more about feeling a connection with something larger than yourself, a sense of community, connection with others, feeling strength and comfort from your connections. Again, a sense of meaning and purpose in life, so there's some overlap with post-traumatic growth, and an overall sense of harmony and peace. So those all go into the idea of spirituality. We have a measure called the facet SP, and the subscales are meaning and peace, and the role of faith in illness. So we did a study where we interviewed people, um, long-term participants in our program. So what we do after the eight-week program is we have what we call a drop-in group. So graduates of the eight-week program are all invited to come to this weekly drop-in. And some people have been coming for many, many years. In this particular study, we interviewed seven women and, and two men. And they had been, they were an average age of 60 years, and they had been active in this drop-in group between one and six years. So on average, for about two, two, point, you know, two and a half years, they have been coming on a pretty regular basis to these weekly meetings. So we did an interviews with them and followed by a focus group. And we just analyzed the data using a computer program. And we came up with these different themes. And these are all quotes from them that describe their experience in the program. So the first theme we called shifting paradigms. And they talked about the eight-week group at the beginning. The benefit for me has come in the long term. Things keep happening a little bit here and there. The eight-week program was just a start. They're actively searching for ways to deal with treatment and recovery. This person says, my motivation was there was no treatment left for me. I felt I better figure out how to cope with this disease. Meditation was what I thought I had to do. Seeing things in a new way, new possibilities. This whole notion of embracing change is a constant. I never really thought of it that way before. Making changes in lifestyle and attitudes. I've learned it's not about form. It's not about doing things perfectly. It's just about connecting with ourselves and others. They talked about self-regulation and having tools for coping. You don't have any control over what happens, but you have some control over how you deal with it. And having more internal control, I was under the impression I could control most things. That was completely blown out of the water with the cancer diagnosis, which left me paralyzed. Meditation gives me time to look within. By looking within, that gives me control. And feeling like an active participant in their own recovery. So do I think my chances are better because I'm eating differently, meditating, and doing yoga? Yes, I think my chances are good. And having more emotional control. When things really start getting me down, I'll just stop and do some meditation. It really takes me over that hump and I can go on. We talked about the group being important, having a sense of community and belongingness. I've been afraid of coming up to this building. So it was at the cancer center. They talked about the cancer center. For a long time, all of a sudden, I was being welcomed to this building. That was quite beautiful common experience. It's a very powerful experience sitting in a circle of people who've been affected by cancer. I find in it a very profound understanding because we all share a similar experience. You're constantly reminded of your own humanity and the humanity of others. Sharing difficult experience, it's about life right in that circle, right in that room. It's every part of living and dying, breathing, giving, and sharing. And sharing practice. There seems to be greater energy when a group of people come together and meditate. They talked about personal growth. I'm not feeling my cancer is growing. It's becoming less and less. It's secondary. I'm looking at the positive aspects of becoming healthier, maybe even healthier than I was before, and how it changes people's perspectives. Cancer can make a person very bitter, or it can make them very wise. I'm not crazy about having had cancer, but it has certainly done a lot in my life and de developing feelings of meaning and gratitude. How did I make a switch from being negative to positive? It was gratitude. Meditating in my own limited experience gave me the chance to give the chaos some kind of meaning. And knowing oneself better. It's changed my outlook on life, my relationship to other people, and most importantly, my relationship to myself. 
the person has to go inside and find out who they are, what their motivating factors are, and what is good for them. I spoke about spirituality. Even though the program is very secular, we don't really talk about religion or spirituality. It kind of comes in when people meditate. Whenever I find that I'm really bogged down, I go and I meditate. I've become a lot more spiritual. I would say, to use a cliche, it is about spirituality. What's the definition? It's about your connection. You're connected to something outside of yourself. This is exercise of the spirit. You come for not only learning how to connect more with yourself, but you're also connecting with other people who understand the pain. It's wise. There's this universality about it. You don't have to come from a certain faith tradition to take some of these things away. So another study that we did, we call it a mixed method study before and after the program. And we just took 14 people in the program and they filled out those questionnaires I mentioned that asked them you know, about some elements of spirituality and post-traumatic growth. And then we interviewed them about questions that they had shown improvements on. So if somebody said, I feel more at peace, then we did an interview and said, you told us you felt more at peace. Can you explain what that means to you? So through those interviews, we had themes of developing self-awareness, self-efficacy, more acceptance and letting go. I can just give you a quote from one woman. Who, her name was Sylvia. She was 50 years old, 13 years education, you know, employed as a middle manager, early stage breast cancer. She had surgery and radiation therapy, so she's a pretty typical case. And she said, I think I am better. I stand at better peace with myself. And it's because of the meditation. By all means, I know that. After the retreat, that's the six-hour retreat, I said that I was at such peace, it was so spiritual. And in terms of post-traumatic growth, she says, I always knew that there was something I had to learn from this. But I never knew what it was. I never knew. I think now what I've learned is to appreciate things, to take time for things, which I think before I was always so busy and always so controlling and, you know, quite bossy. I'm at peace. I understand the cancer a lot better. And if it recurs, I think I'm prepared for that. So I've just got a bit more time here, and I don't want to talk too much, but I'll tell you about one last study we've done developing an online program for people who don't have access to the in-person program, and that may be the case for many of you as well. Um, so we took 64 people who lived in remote areas all around Alberta, and we used this um, website called eMindful.com. First of all, we wanted to see if it was feasible, whether people would actually do it online and complete the program. And then we also had them fill out the same kind of questionnaire as, as the in-person program so we could compare the changes. So this is what it looks like. It's kind of like a webinar that we're in, actually. So you can, except you see the presenter here. So this is the teacher here, and he might make himself big here, or he maybe has some content here. And you can see pictures of all the other participants. So there's you know, 10 or 15 people on at the same time, and it's just like an in-person group. Everyone's there at the same time, and they can talk and interact. And we sent them all uh, webcams and headsets so they could do that. And then when they did the same kind of practice, they would see the instructor there doing it, and they would do it themselves right in front of their computer. So we asked people how satisfied they were. And most people, so 40% said it met their expectations, and 60% said it actually exceeded their expectations, so better than they thought. We asked if they'd recommend it. Almost all of them, 92% said yes. And 8% uh, said yes, but with the reservation that people needed to have a quiet spot and you know, set it up so they could see the computer and practice meditation. These are some of the graphs of the outcomes. So we're showing decreases. This is mood disturbance. The mindfulness group are the solid line. So right here, you're just showing more decrease in the mindfulness people compared to the waiting group. And we see that with the other outcomes, too. This is stress symptoms. This one here is spiritual well-being, so not as large in effect, but still there. And this is a measure of mindfulness. And I'll end with just a few quotes from people in this program. They said, being able to access the course online was a huge benefit in terms of my energy level. I'm still in treatment. Driving to another location can be taxing on my energy. I was able to conserve my energy strictly for the course and content. Also, setting up this time and location at home made it easier on non-course days to keep up with the program and practices since I was already comfortable in my environment. Meditation and body scan was extremely helpful during my first radiation therapy as I calm my fears and emotions. I do it every day during my treatment as I lay on the treatment table and just become aware of my surroundings when they tell me that my treatment is done. Good timing and thank you. I truly appreciate having had the opportunity to participate and will definitely incorporate mindfulness and yoga 
and meditation in my daily life to enhance my quality of life and contribute to my ongoing experience of living with cancer versus dying of cancer. I believe this program has changed my life and given me tools to live successfully no matter what happens. Practicing is a work in progress, but I'm getting much better, not reacting, not letting my feelings and thoughts overwhelm me, etc. I have great faith that practicing mindfulness will not only see me through, but build my resilience too. I was somewhat hesitant at the beginning of the course because I'm not a touchy-feely type person. I had reservations about yoga and meditation, although I had very little actual experience. I found that I really enjoyed the sessions, and in many aspects, the weekly sessions were a highlight of my week. I felt a sense of well-being when involved with the program. I think the fact that the group was from all over Alberta and that we would unlikely run into each other was a positive thing. I didn't have to worry about someone in the group talking to other people that I know or work with. This is from somebody in a small community where that happens. <laughs> Thank you, MBSR. It's a great practice to share any way we can. In a post-cancer phase, accessing the course online is great. One less outing. The online format works. It held, for me at least, just the right amount of contact and closeness for me to be comfortable. I truly appreciate the graceful and loving way the course was conducted, as well as the gentle reminders and patience. So just to summarize, the mindfulness program improves mood, stress symptoms, sleep, leads to feelings of spirituality and benefit finding. Learning in a group enhances outcomes, and the online versions have similar benefits. Now, I was going to go through some other material, but I think I'll just summarize some of the other health populations that research has been done on, and I might leave it at that. Um, so as I mentioned, there's hundreds and hundreds of studies, and it's been applied to all these different problems from depression and anxiety. Most of the mental health populations would be depression and anxiety, but also trauma, different phobias. There's an adaptation for people with eating disorders, substance abuse, uh, insomnia specifically. They're even starting to apply it to psychotic disorders and schizophrenia. Other health conditions, kind of you name it, um, people have tried it. A lot of work in hypertension and cardiovascular disease. We've done a lot of work in cancer, as have others, HIV, irritable bowel, there's quite a lot of work, pain, diabetes, you'll we'll see more and more of this. And then also looking at different processes in healthy people, like um, just coping with stress, looking at improving attention, cognition, um, even healing from moon, uh, wounds and other um, sort of surgery and those kind of things. Uh, all right, so I'm going to stop there, I think, so that we can turn it over for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Carlson. Before we take any questions, and just a reminder to please use the questions box to do this, we'll do a quick poll to see how many people were participating in today's webinar. I'll just give everyone a few seconds to fill out that poll on your screen. All right, Linda, so first off, we have a few comments of envy that you're living in Canmore and looking out at views like that. Uh, some folks tuning in from different places across Canada are, are feeling a little jealous, and certainly we are in our Toronto office here. Um, <laughs> the first question we have is around, is this practice of mindfulness, is it meant or encouraged for people at any point along the cancer journey, um, or for particular times during treatment or after treatment? Oh, absolutely. I think um, even learning it, you know, in anticipation of starting treatment is a good idea. We're just, you know, in our clinical program, we have people right from the time of diagnosis forward. Um, people who have a bit of a harder time participating in the in-person groups and making all the practice sessions tend to be people going through chemotherapy who may, you know, have a lack of energy or they have lots of appointments. But that doesn't mean you can't do minimal types of mindfulness interventions like um, in fact, you can, I should send the link, but you can download, actually it's, oh, it's not on this page. Um, there's a website called cancerbridges.ca, and you can download the guided meditation tracks we use in our program. They're free, just MP3 files. If you go to cancerbridges.ca and search for meditation tracks, you'll find them there. And so you can listen to those, even if you're not doing a full-on program. And I think there's benefits at any point during you know, diagnosis, treatment, cancer recovery, for sure. Um, and the book that we wrote is also a good resource at any time. Thank you. Um, is mindfulness and mindfulness practice as important for caregivers, partners, or family members as it is for the patient, or in this case, the man going through prostate cancer? 
Absolutely. You know, and our program is open to patients and their support people, and we get lots of people bringing their spouses, their children, you know, friends, uh, co-workers. We've actually done a study um, looking at partners, and so we have patients and the, and the partner they brought with them fill out questionnaires before and after, and what we found was almost the same uh, magnitude, like the same amount of improvement in the partners. The patients were a little bit more stressed out and depressed at the beginning, not a lot actually, but they both improve similarly over time. So we encourage them. We know that being a caregiver has its own stressors and we always say to people, you're not here just to support the person with cancer, you're here for yourself. You know, you need this too. Great. That kind of ties into the next question which is around, is there the same opportunity for post-traumatic growth uh, for loved ones as well as for the patients knowing that sometimes the diagnosis can be uh, almost as traumatic for a loved one as it is for the patient going through the cancer diagnosis. Absolutely. You know, we see the same kind of process in people who've had any kind of experience that's seen as traumatic or upsetting that makes you stop and take pause and think, wait a minute, is this how we want to live our lives, right? So we see the same kind of improvement um, in, the, in the support people and the partners as well. Great, thank you. And for those tuning in for whom this is new information, who might never have practiced meditation or yoga, what's the best first step to take, especially if they're not in the Calgary area? Yeah, I mean, there are programs at other cancer centers across the country. So if you're being treated in Winnipeg or Toronto, um, Ottawa, Vancouver, they actually, all of those places offer mindfulness-based stress reduction or cancer recovery programs. So look and see if one's available because I really do encourage you to sign up for a group to begin with. It's a lot easier to learn uh, with an instructor and other people rather than completely on your own. There's also online programs that the online, the mindfulness-based cancer recovery program isn't available to everyone online, but there are other online mindfulness-based stress reduction programs you can do even through that company eMindful I mentioned. There's also many, many mindfulness apps and um, websites where you can download guided meditations. And there's lots of books people can read, and I recommended Full Catastrophe Living by John Kabat-Zinn um, and the book we've written, Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery, are good resources, and there's many, many others too. Great. So that sort of answers some of the other questions we've had around access to resources. So the best places to be to go is to go to the cancer centers and ask for information to check out some of those books as well as the websites you've listed up on the screen there. Um, yeah. Is that sort of the best place to go? I think so, yeah. I mean, first check at your cancer center because many more are um, beginning to uh, adopt these programs and offer them to people. There's also another resource called Cancer Chat Canada, and they have um, online text-based support groups, and I know they've been thinking of developing a mindfulness group too, although I'm not sure if it's being offered yet, but you can check out that website. Great. Thank you very much, Linda, for providing information on such an important topic and one of great interest to all of us. Thank you, too, to our participants for being on the call today and for your questions and comments. I also want to gratefully acknowledge the support of our sponsors, Abby, Estellis, and Jansen, who make this webinar series possible. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, May 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time with Peter Millette, speaking about his experience with prostate cancer from patient to advocate. As always, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Prostate Cancer Canada website in the coming days. If you are looking for further information on prostate cancer, please connect with our helpline at 1-855-PCC-INFO. That's 1-855-722-4636. Or you can email them at support at prostatecancer.ca. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your evening.